All right, hello and, and welcome. A good afternoon for all of you, to all of you from Singapore. My name is Dr. Peter Chang, and uh, I'm a cardiologist and a vascular medicine specialist. And I'm the moderator today uh, for today's webinar. And with me is my co-moderator, Dr. Sarah Aiken, who is a vascular and endovascular surgeon based in Sydney, Australia. And it is, of course, my great pleasure to be the first to welcome you to today's APSC Cloud Webinar titled Challenge and Breakthrough in Holistic Management of PAD, Asian Pacific Update in 2021. I'm also very grateful for, to Professor Lind for organizing such a distinguished panel for today's program. Now, as everyone here know, uh, lower extremity peripheral arterial disease is without doubt emerging as a burden in cardiovascular healthcare because of things like underscreening, delay in diagnosis, and the uncertainty of therapeutic strategy. Now in the program today, for the next two and a half hours, we'll update you on the current knowledge in screening and diagnosis, on the optical medical control of uh, both symptomatic and asymptomatic PAD, the um, potential game changer of dual pathway inhibition with DOAC, and, and go over some of the therapeutic decisions in the choice between endovascular intervention and surgical open revascularization when it comes to critical limb ischemia. And we'll round off by talking about supervised hospital based or as well as, well as home based exercise rehabilitation. Um, I'm one of the moderators, and this is my, my co moderator. So, as we get things going, um, we'll, we'll, each of our presenters will have 20 minutes to, to, to discuss the topic that, were, that was given, uh, followed by five minutes of discussion amongst ourselves. Uh, each of us will get to be a panelist and we can just bounce ideas off each other, share our experiences we have. So um, without further ado, um, let me introduce you to the first feature speaker today. Uh, the first speaker is Dr. Suko Adiato from University of Indonesia. Uh, he's, in, he's a cardiovascular interventionist who does coronaries, peripheries, and aortic intervention. And here, he's here to speak on screening and diagnosis for peripheral arterial disease in adults with high risk when who and how. All right. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Peter Chang. Uh, very uh, appreciate the invitation from the APAC uh, and uh, Professor Juin Lee, and of course, uh, the co-chairman, uh, Dr. Sarah Aitken. Uh, let me uh, start uh, sharing my screen. Uh, can you hear me, uh, everyone? Yeah, we can hear you well. Uh, thank yes. you very much. Okay. All right. Can you see my slide? Yes. All right. So the title given to me was Screening Diagnosis in Adult with High Risk, When, Who, and uh, How. <clears throat> uh, this is a, a patient of mine uh, with a triple coronary disease with left main disease who are about to undergo uh, cabbage and uh, during examination, we found out that this patient has recent uh, non-hemorrhagic stroke with bilateral carotid stenosis, requiring uh, at least one carotid revascularization before uh, cabbage. And uh, soon after, we found out that this patient also has bilateral ileic stenosis. So during the uh, angiogram of the uh, carotid artery before doing carotid stenting, we found a problem of, uh, uh, of advancing the catheter uh, in the iliac artery. And uh, we found out that there's a critical uh, stenosis of uh, the iliac uh, artery as well. So these uh, patients really resemble patients with multiple atherosclerotic disease, which is uh, not uh, rarely seen in uh, our practice uh, today. <clears throat> Another patient of mine, a uh, female patient with diabetes, uh, had a coronary artery disease uh, undergoing PCI with 4DES uh, several years ago, came with a non-healing ulcer and turned out to have a very severe uh, below the knee lesion. But the most important uh, thing, uh, uh, interesting part of this patient is not the lesion, but the age, which is 98. Uh, probably it's not that really uncommon in uh, Australian or Singaporean uh, pop uh, population, but here in Indonesia, uh, it is very incredible to see patient at the age of 98, almost 100, 
that I wouldn't imagine doing a, a intervention in this patient until uh, two weeks ago when I, uh, when I saw these patients. So uh, with the, the uh, population parameter that, that is changing uh, all over the world, including in Asia, where we have uh, aging populations dominates uh, or uh, more, uh, much more prevalent as compared to previous years, uh, I think we will see some uh, uh, more uh, uh, serious uh, problem in degenerative disease, including atherosclerotic disease and peripheral artery disease. This is uh, the prevalence of uh, diabetes, uh, 2010 and the projection in 2030, we see that the number is increasing alarmingly. And uh, this is the prevalence of smoking. Uh, we have to admit that in Indonesia, the number of smoking uh, among adults, uh, adults is uh, over 50%, uh, which uh, contribute also to uh, premature atherosclerotic disease, uh, including uh, peripheral artery disease. So by projection, uh, by age, uh, we are seeing much more uh, peripheral artery disease in patients uh, starting from 50 to 60 years of age. And with age, uh, again, uh, we, when patients have uh, diabetes, we will see number of patients uh, will be increasing. So it's, uh, uh, as uh, mentioned by Chairman, uh, this will be a problem for us uh, in the next uh, future. And definitely by projection as well, we can see that our region here, Southeast Asian region, has the most prevalent uh, peripheral artery disease as compared to other parts of the world. <laughs> the question is also when, when should we screen? So definitely we don't want to see patient in this stage of disease because uh, in this stage of disease, uh, we are uh, absolutely very late because uh, amputation is uh, definitely unavoidable. <clears throat> so we start, uh, have, uh, we have to, see a patient uh, with increased, uh, increased risk uh, of peripheral artery disease, screen it and treat it so that we can prevent uh, mortality. You know, the uh, patient with PAD has a, a number one killer of being cardio uh, having cardiovascular disease and of course amputations. And this is the uh, uh, guidelines uh, from uh, uh, AHA, which is adopted by Asia Pacific uh, uh, Society. Uh, uh, and they recognize that the patient uh, with increased risk of uh, PAD is age uh, more or equal to 65 years of age. This might be different from country to country. We will show our data later. Uh, those uh, with uh, age of 50 to 64, but have a uh, risk factors for atherosclerosis, especially uh, with multiple atherosclerotic disease, diabetes, uh, smoking. Uh, Indonesian homework is very uh, heavy with 50% uh, or more adult with smoking, hyperlipidemia, hypertension, albuminuria, chronic kidney disease, and family history of uh, peripheral artery disease. So age less than uh, 50 years of age, but uh, have type 1 uh, diabetes uh, mellitus and one additional risk factors for atherosclerotic disease. Individual with known atherosclerotic disease, as uh, we show several uh, cases in other uh, vascular beds, including coronary, carotid, subclavian, renal, or uh, 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 AAA. Uh, maybe the, the Tersara uh, knows more about uh, uh, ethnicity or uh, uh, generic of indigenous Australian ethnicity that uh, uh, pose a more propensity of peripheral artery disease in this uh, group of patients. So how again uh, we have to screen this patient uh, with history and physical examinations uh, thoroughly uh, with history being intermittent uh, claudications, uh, non-joint uh, related uh, exertional lower extremity symptoms, which is uh, not that typical for claudications, impaired walk, uh, walking function, and of course, uh, ischemic uh, rest pain. Physical examination being uh, abnormal lower extremity pulse examination, uh, uh, which is sometimes uh, uh, missed, uh, especially in those with uh, non-typical uh, symptoms. So vascular brui, non-healing uh, lower extremity wound, uh, gangrene, uh, and other uh, uh, suggestive or lower extremity physical uh, finding, which uh, include uh, atrophy and loss uh, of hairs. <clears throat> so how, again, uh, uh, we should uh, uh, review this patient with uh, high risk of peripheral artery disease. We have to uh, again, uh, ask the patient thoroughly uh, uh, the typical symptoms. 
again, uh, we have to be very careful in patients with multiple uh, atherosclerotic disease. Sometimes they don't have intermittent claudication because the patient has angina before the patient have a claudication. So it uh, uh, clouds uh, the symptoms of uh, peripheral artery disease because of angina. Uh, through uh, physical examinations, uh, including uh, palpations of extremity pulses, uh, femoral, popliteal, do not miss anything, uh, dorsal spedis, uh, posterior tibial, uh, and auscultation uh, if uh, there's a bruit, uh, and, uh, and an inspection of the legs and feet, including the presence of uh, uh, ulcer and also uh, uh, atrophy. <clears throat> uh, we have to also uh, measure the blood pressure, uh, the brachial blood pressure, uh, the, uh, the left and the right to compare which one is higher because uh, as we mentioned, uh, there might be some stenosis in the subclavian or innominate artery that uh, makes uh, the blood pressures in the bra uh, brachial artery lower uh, that will uh, obscure the uh, uh, true number of uh, ankle brachial index. So ankle brachial index has been the first line of uh, uh, screening uh, or diagnosis uh, of peripheral uh, artery disease and uh, 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 patients with history and physical examination suggestive of uh, peripheral artery disease, uh, resting uh, ankle brachial index is uh, uh, recommended. Also, uh, segmental blood pressure and waveform analysis to uh, predict or to uh, 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 predict the uh, possible locations of uh, stenosis of, or occlusion. So also uh, uh, patients uh, with uh, borderline uh, ankle brachial index with suggestive uh, uh, symptoms should uh, undergo exercise uh, ankle uh, brachial index. <clears throat> So uh, uh, sometimes we see patients uh, with uh, extensive wound. Uh, so uh, ankle brachial index might not be, uh, be feasible. Then uh, you have to go for the, the, the two brachial index. And when uh, the uh, ankle brachial index is larger than uh, 1.4, uh, which uh, signifies the incompressible, incompressible uh, arteries, then we should go for uh, two brachial index. Uh, sometimes when we are not sure, the borderline ankle brachial index, we can go for uh, uh, exercise uh, ankle brachial index. And when needed, uh, we can also uh, use uh, two brachial index or TCPO2, uh, transcutaneous uh, uh, oxygen tensions or skin perfusion uh, pressure. When the, uh, the uh, uh, number is also not uh, uh, very confirmed, but we have a non-healing wound or gangrene, of course, we can uh, exercise uh, the uh, use of uh, two brachial index with waveform, also the transcutaneous uh, oxygen pressures and uh, skin perfusion pressure. Well, sometimes we also, uh, we also have to analyze the anatomy of the, the periphery, uh, peripheral uh, vessel, especially when uh, we uh, 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 determine that this patient should go uh, revascularization either for non-healing ulcer or uh, resting pain or uh, lifestyle limiting uh, claudication. And we can use a uh, duplex ultrasound, uh, CT angiogram, uh, magnetic resonance uh, angiography, or even uh, digital subtraction angiography uh, whenever we uh, pro uh, start uh, uh, to perform uh, endovascular interventions or uh, planning for uh, surgical uh, revascularizations. Uh, patient with, with AAA also uh, includes a patient with a systemic atherosclerotic disease. Then a screening with du uh, duplex ultrasound for uh, AAA is reasonable uh, for patient with uh, peripheral artery disease. However, uh, in patient with uh, peripheral artery disease uh, should not uh, be routinely screened for asymptomatic atherosclerotic disease in other uh, vascular bed. So this is uh, the EAC and uh, European Society of Vascular Surgery guidelines. Uh, they recommend uh, that those who have, uh, 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 for those who have, uh, should have uh, ankle brachial index uh, in clinical practice. Of course, patients who have a uh, clinical suspicions of uh, lower extremity arterial disease uh, uh, with findings from 
uh, history taking or uh, physical examination, including uh, absence of pulse, uh, intermittent claudications, or non-healing ulcer. Uh, patient at high risk of uh, lower extremity arterial disease uh, because uh, the presence of other uh, vascular bed, including uh, coronary artery disease, triple uh, A, and other uh, risks uh, such as uh, cro uh, chronic kidney disease and heart failure. They also uh, recommend a patient with asymptomatic, but uh, uh, also risk uh, for uh, lo lower extremity extraneal disease uh, are those who are uh, older than uh, 65 years, uh, younger than 65 years, but at high risk of uh, cardiovascular uh, disease uh, according to ASC guidelines, uh, and also uh, a, a man or woman uh, older than 50, but has a family history of lower extremity arterial disease. So we are uh, also doing uh, some studies in our populations, uh, especially uh, those who are undergoing coronary uh, uh, angiography or uh, uh, coronary uh, uh, angioplasty because of coronary disease, uh, as uh, it is uh, one of the patients who are at risk of uh, having uh, peripheral artery disease. So we screen patients who are undergoing a coronary angiogram and uh, PCI and uh, look at the occurrence of uh, aneurysm, peripheral artery disease and carotid artery stenosis and looks at the factors that may contribute to the presence of this uh, peripheral artery disease. This is the uh, definition that we use. And uh, uh, briefly, uh, those who are undergoing coronary angiography and proven coronary artery disease uh, will have a history taking and a measurement of uh, ultrasound to see the presence of abdominal aortic uh, abdo uh, aneurysm, ankle brachial index, and carotid ultrasound. Oh, very sorry, St this is still in Bahasa, but we included over uh, 13,000 patients uh, undergoing a coronary a procedure and end up uh, with uh, just uh, uh, less than 20 uh, non-included in the study. So the main uh, age was almost uh, 60 uh, with male uh, being the uh, pre predominant sex uh, with uh, hypertension with the, uh, is, uh, the major uh, risk factors that is involved uh, with diabetes mellitus almost half of the patient and dyslipidemia uh, almost uh, 60%. Some have a stroke or TIA, uh, which is 7.3%. Uh, uh, of course, the uh, main symptom will be angina, but uh, some also have claudication, resting pain, and some uh, also, very uh, small number, have uh, non-healing ulcers. This is the uh, medications. Uh, and this is the, the result. We have a one vessel, two vessel, uh, three vessel, left main disease and combinations of one vessel with left main uh, with uh, uh, almost uh, similar uh, distribution. And this is our fundings, uh, uh, almost uh, uh, quite different from previous uh, published study with, with AAA only constitute of 1.4%, which is very low as compared to other studies. Peripheral artery disease uh, in 10.9% of all population, carotid artery stenosis 4.5%. Uh, so the presence of any vascular disease, which include AAA, PAD, and carotid artery stenosis is almost 16% of total populations. Uh, so this is the summary. Uh, coronary disease, pure coronary artery disease is uh, found in 84.55%. Uh, uh, some overlap, of course, in peripheral carotid artery stenosis and abdominal aortic aneurysm. There is one who have uh, uh, four atherosclerotic disease, coronary, peripheral carotid artery disease, and abdominal aortic aneurysm. So there's a uh, uh, what uh, correlations between the severity of uh, uh, coronary disease with uh, uh, the presence of AAA, but uh, the trend was not significant uh, statistically. Uh, but for peripheral artery disease, there is a, a, a clear uh, relationship between the severity of a one vessel, two vessel, and three vessel disease uh, with the presence of a peripheral uh, artery disease, and this is very significant for the trend.
there is also a significant trend in uh, severity of carotid artery disease with uh, carotid artery stenosis, with uh, three vessel disease being uh, represented by 50 uh, patients uh, with uh, positive uh, carot carotid artery stenosis. So there's also correlation between uh, severity of coronary artery disease with any vascular disease, uh, which, is close, which include those three uh, diseases, uh, one vessel, two vessel, and of course, three vessel disease represents uh, uh, more, much, uh, patients with uh, more uh, uh, other uh, vascular disease. We try to analyze uh, the factors that is influencing uh, the relationship, and we came out uh, with uh, age, uh, smoking habit, and diabetes uh, mellitus uh, for triple A. Uh, uh, interestingly, uh, look at diabetes mellitus. This is a negative predictor uh, for triple A. Uh, this is confirming a previous study uh, in which a patient with diabetes have less triple uh, A as compared to uh, non-diabetes. But again, uh, we see age of 60. Uh, this is probably uh, different from country to country, the recommendation that we just discussed uh, was 65, but in Indonesian population, probably we have younger age uh, to have a, a risk of uh, atherosclerotic disease. So oh, I cannot go next, sorry. Uh, let me unscreen first. Sorry. Okay, so we go to uh, peripheral artery disease. Uh, similarly, we also analyze the factors that are contributing uh, to peripheral artery disease. And we see that diabetes mellitus is very significant. Uh, those with a stroke or TIA is also significant, uh, but coronary artery disease uh, is not. So, but uh, abdominal aortic aneurysm also uh, significant uh, for predictors of uh, uh, peripheral artery disease in coronary populations. This is carotid artery stenosis. And we also see age of more than 60. Of course, uh, stroke and TIA uh, have a very good relationship with the presence of carotid artery stenosis. And this is interesting, coronary artery disease with the presence of uh, three vessel disease also have a, a significant relationship with the presence of carotid artery stenosis. Similarly, for any vascular disease, age, diabetes, uh, stroke, TIA, and the presence of multifessal disease also signifies uh, the presence of other, uh, other uh, uh, vascular disease in coronary populations. So basically we are seeing the same uh, factors that is uh, associated uh, with the presence of peripheral artery disease uh, in the whole uh, three uh, uh, peripheral uh, disease that we screen. So uh, what uh, I have learned, uh, uh, hopefully uh, all of us can discuss uh, the take-home message uh, PAD is becoming more prevalent in aging population with multiple uh, uh, risk factors. Uh, identifying patient with increased risk of peripheral artery disease is important to decrease mortality and amputations, of course. Age, uh, the presence of multiple atherosclerotic lesions, multiple risk factors are factors to consider for screening. Ankle brachial index is the main method of screening, uh, two pressure and TBI. Uh, should be used for incompressible uh, arteries. Anatomical evaluations as, such as uh, uh, duplex ultrasound and CT or uh, invasive angiography should be used uh, in patients who are candidate for surgical or interventional uh, revascularization. Thank you very much for your attention. Okay, thank you so much for that talk. Um, I definitely learned a lot. I think what, I'll just start off by asking, um, I've always thought the, the um, sort of the, the, in, a, in a cath lab before patients go for angiogram or angioplasty, the patients present an excellent opportunity for us to investigate whether there's lower extremity arterial disease because you have to feel for the femoral pulse. Why not just put your hand down and feel for pedal pulses as well? But as, 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 your, as your data suggests, you know, the only predictor for 
for a peripheral arterial disease is in, in fact triple vessel disease and not single or double vessel disease. And I, I find that to be quite interesting and don't know if you have any comment on that. Yeah, of course, uh, definitely before patient going to cath lab, we should screen that because according to the guidelines uh, and as we discussed, this patient actually uh, has uh, the criteria of uh, being patient at high risk of peripheral artery disease and should uh, actually undergo uh, physical examination and history taking to uh, rule in or rule out a peripheral artery disease. But uh, to be honest, the problem now uh, is that we are shifting to radial. That's right. For access. That's right. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, <laughs> so most of the time, uh, I have to admit that we miss uh, the, the, what, uh, the uh, obligations of uh, doing a comprehensive uh, uh, peripheral uh, pulses uh, before uh, going to cat lab. Right. Yes, that, that leads into a question that I had, mm -hmm. Dr. Adiato, which uh, yeah. what are some of the barriers you think exist in terms of us doing effective screening programs for patients with PAD? And I'm quite impressed at how many patients you managed to enroll in your study where you were doing screening. Mm -hmm. And a follow on question would be, how has that study changed the practice in your institution and what are you doing to address these problems? Thank you for the questions. Of course, uh, logically, we would think that uh, the presence of atherosclerotic disease in one vessel would lead to, would similarly put this patient at high risk of uh, having another atherosclerosis somewhere else. But looking at the data, the presence of uh, other is a uh, really not that prevalent. So doing screening for all patients would not be cost effective. That is why uh, in some part we are doing uh, this study to recognize which patient should we screen. So mm. definitely if the patient had three vessel disease, have diabetes, having age of more than 65, definitely those patients we would screen mm -hmm. uh, learning from this study. Mm -hmm. Um, so if, if I may ask a question to, to everybody here, yeah. um, you know, I've recently been approached by a podiatrist who has the idea of why instead of doing uh, TBI as a follow-up to ABI when the reading is about 1.4, why not do a TBI first? And if that's normal, um, as in above 0 0.7, then we can just forego the ABI. <laughs> What's your thought on that? Because I have yet to find any sort of a guidance on this, this concept. Um, do you have any, any, any what, what, what's, what's your opinion on this? My, my thoughts on this, Peter, is that the um, operator variability is a lot more for TBI than for ABI, which is right. why it's not, not recommended as the primary screening modality. Mm. Um, See Dr. Adiato nodding his head to that as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, in Indonesia, we are, uh, there's a local company who is trying to make an ankle brachial index. So, they find it much more difficult to make the cuff for the toe as compared mm. to the, uh, what the usual man said. So, uh, I think I would agree that availability is the, main issue for that. Correct. Yes, I do. definitely agree because my, 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 my comment to her was, well, you keep the room so cold. How are you ever <laughs> going to get a reading in your toes? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I'm just mindful of the time. So I might introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Din Huynh Lin, coming to us from Vietnam. Um, let me just share my screen here. Um, so Dr. Lin is a cardiologist at the Vietnam National Heart Institute and also at Hanoi Medical University. Um, so welcome. Yes, um, good morning, Mr. Chairman, um, Mrs. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, can you see my slide now? Yes, that's fantastic. Thank you, Dr. Din. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me to the 
sessions today. It is my great honor to be here today. And I used to be a kind of fellow in National Heart Center Singapore under the supervision of Dr. Jack Tan. And now, but I'm now, I'm now doing more and more peripheral artery disease. And so I today I will be here to present my presentation about the optimal medical therapy for lower extremity arterial diseases. So it is a very typical clinic, clinical case of a PD patient. You can see a non unhealing wound with the ischemic rest pain and this is loss and patient has no vagina, but you can see the Q wave and inverted T wave additional with uh, low EF and regional wound motion abnormalities in LED lesion on the echo. And patient has uh, renal failure, high uh, A1C and the duplex ultrasound showing very severe stenosis and occlusion of the peripheral artery disease. So you can see that there are many, many challenges at lower extremities, artery disease. Patient might have very diverse clinical presentations. Patients come very late, uh, especially in my place uh, with end-stage disease, with many comorbidities like coronary artery disease, heart failure, renal failure, high bleeding risk. And actually we don't have a good specific training on peripheral intervention compared to PCI. We have few food care department, few rehabilitation program. So everything you can see that it ends up with a very high rate of major amputation. And it is a, the, one of the main challenge of uh, LEAP is that it uh, have a very high rate of comorbidities like coronary artery disease or carotid and uh, renal artery disease as shown in the ESC guideline. And the life, because of that, the lifelong risk is not only the lead uh, event like claudication or amputation, the patient with uh, PAD will have, uh, you know, that very high risk of coronary artery disease and a stroke, uh, acute MI, vagina, heart failure in the lifelong. And, uh, Another challenge is that not all lesions are repairable. Some lesion is uh, unsavageable, large damage. Uh, the procedure of the revascularization may take a very long time with high cost and high risk. And even with successful peripheral revascularization, there are some data showing that the lifelong risk of major amputation uh, is still increasing. Uh, patients still have risk of myocardial infection and stroke uh, after some years after the index revascularization. Um, yes, uh, even with the successful uh, PTA, uh, you can see that if the patient has concomitant of coronary artery disease, we uh, still need a secondary prevention in chronic PAD patient. So uh, what, what do you have in the guideline? It is the guideline says that uh, we do have a loss of trial here, the IPTC, Capri, HOPE trial, showing that aspirin or clopidogrel or AC inhibitors and the statins will um, provide some uh, benefit in patients with peripheral artery disease. It is a guideline directed medical therapy. But uh, in this very recent uh, trial in the GACC, you can see that not all patients get adequate uh, optimal medical therapy. You can see that the med optimal medical medical therapy is only about 44% on admission and less than 50% on discharge. And if you can see the graph in the right hand side, you can see that the high risk with um, higher comorbidities like older age, uh, heart failure, COPD, CNTI, renal failure has a lower uh, prevalence of 
adequate uh, medical therapy. And of course, another challenge is that the patient with uh, PD, uh, normally they have a higher age, you know, older with renal disease, liver disease, anemia, low platelet count. So they have higher bleeding risk compared to other population. So uh, if go back to the guideline, it is said that medical management for PD patient will include antithrombotic therapy, lipid lowering agents, uh, blood glucose control, as well as blood pressure control. So first of all is the antithrombotic therapy. Uh, we do have a lot of uh, data, a lot of trials showing that uh, antiplatelet therapy will provide very good secondary prevention for uh, mice or male in patients with peripheral artery disease. So aspirin or another oral antiplatelet therapy is protective in most types of patient. Uh, patient with or without previous MI, patient with or without previous stroke or other high risk, it will provide better profit uh, compared to placebo. And I, I do think that all patients with PD, we need aspirin for lifelong. But uh, how about the uh, combination of aspirin and some uh, anticoagulant. It is the WAVE trial which included more than 2,000 patients and it, it compared uh, aspirin versus aspirin and uh, VKA. VKA. And you can see that there's no difference in ischemic event, but the, this combination will increase the risk of bleeding. So if you ask me, should I uh, add a uh, let's say the VKA uh, plus aspirin for PAD patient, the answer will be no. And how about um, more potent uh, antiplatelet therapy? Let's say that Ticagrelor compared with uh, Clopidogrel, it is the Oglid trial. Uh, it is the randomization uh, compared with Clopidogrel and Ticagrelor with the end point is that uh, cardiovascular death, MI, stroke, amputation. And in the right-hand side, you can see that the um, efficacy end point is almost the same in all group. So uh, the conclusion is that Ticagrelor is not superior to Clopidogrel in a PAD patient. We do know that a patient uh, after angioplasty coronary angioplasty or peripheral angioplasty may benefit from aggressive BAPT, but it is the trial uh, showing on the ather atherosclerosis journal. Uh, you can say that PD patients exhibit a significantly diminished response to BAPT uh, compared uh, to coronary artery disease patients. So, uh, according to many, many trials, we do not think that patient after peripheral angioplasty will benefit a lot with lifelong DAPT, long-term DAPT. So uh, the um, latest guideline from ESC in 2017, I, I know that it is a little bit, uh, I mean, uh, old now, but it say that after uh, percutaneous intervention, we use DAPT for one month only, and after that is SAPT for lifelong. And if patients do need uh, oral anticoagulation, uh, we may need uh, OAC and uh, plus one antiplatelet therapy. There is another very novel agent, and uh, I know that Dr. Kumara will say it in more detail in the later sessions that it is the Voyager PD trial, including more than 6,000 patients with uh, peripheral revascularization surgery or percutaneous intervention. Uh, it compared aspirin with placebo and aspirin with low dose river saban. And the result is that 
uh, low dose rivastamol will reduce a cardiac major event in post revascularization patient. So with this uh, new trial, which is very um, promising, we do understand that now if we uh, assess the bleeding risk and if patient don't have any high bleeding risk, I do think that after uh, revascularization, the addition of Lodo River Savan with Lodo Aspirin will provide some benefit for the patient with peripheral artery disease. So how about lipid lowering, uh, lowering agent? Um, it is the uh, data from the improve it trial. Uh, the question is that in patients with polyvascular disease, with diabetes and uh, vascular disease, uh, what we could do more plus starting uh, in this patient, if it is the post hoc analysis with patient with polyvascular disease, uh, compare patient with statin and placebo versus statin, uh, with the additional of uh, isentimide, the uh, ischemic endpoint is coronary artery disease, stroke, hospitalization. And it, you can see that the conclusion is that isentimide will reduce cardiovascular risk consistently. And if you see at the graph in the right hand side, you can see that the high, highest risk subgroup polyvascular disease and diabetes will have the highest absolute risk reduction. So now I do think that with the patient with uh, diabetes with a polyvascular disease, we give a high dose of statin, but we should add more SMTMI. And it is a very new um, trial uh, Agent, it is the PCSK9 inhibitor. It is the data from the FARA trial. Uh, nearly 4,000 patients with peripheral artery disease, and they add a PCSK9 inhibitor. And they can see that um, it will reduce the primary endpoint, especially in the group with the PAD. Um, you can see that uh, the heart hazard ratio will decrease significantly. And there's another analysis showing that the more aggressive LDL cholesterol target, the better outcome uh, in the limb event. So it is a very new uh, agent and I have to commit that uh, we, we don't have uh, PCSK9 inhibitors in my place, but uh, maybe in the near future, we will we'll indicate this drug for all patients with high risk of uh, peripheral artery disease. So how about diabetes management? We are, all know that the extent of vascular disease appear related to the duration and severity of hyperglycemia and the target of hemoglobin A1c should be less than 7% for all patients with uh, diabetes and CNTI, and metformin is always the first-line agent. How about uh, the sodium uh, glucose um, trans transporter inhibitors? Uh, it is a very uh, promising agent in treating heart failure, in treating many cardiovascular disease with diabetes. But how about uh, the efficacy and safety of this drug in a patient with peripheral artery disease? Unfortunately, we have the CANVAS program says that canagliflozin may increase the risk of amputation as shown in the CANVAS trial. You can see here, uh, compared to the placebo group, the uh, canagliflozin has nearly uh, two times higher amputation. So uh, it might uh, be the black box for the use of SGLT2 inhibitors in the group with peripheral artery disease. Uh, another new agent is the glucagon-like peptide 1 uh, receptor agonist. 
in uh, some trial, the ACL trial, showing that, um, you know, that you give this uh, GNP1 agonist will uh, reduce the risk uh, uh, maize and mill as well in the uh, diabetic uh, peripheral artery disease group. And if uh, the A1C remains above target, despite uh, metformin plus uh, glucagon peptide agonist plus GNT2 inhibitors, we may add some more agents like insulin, sulfonyl ureas, or DPP4 inhibitors. So in conclusion, you can see that um, it is the uh, optimal medical therapy for patients with peripheral artery disease, and we need uh, antithrombotic therapy, uh, which is uh, aspirin or clopidogrel with the highest, uh, with the most strong uh, evidence. And we may add rivosaban low dose. And for the lipid lowering agent, the highest evidence is the use of statin uh, at the maximally tolerated dose, and we may add uh, SNTMI and PCSK9 inhibitors. In uh, how to control diabetes, the um, target A1C should be less than 7%, and the first line agent should be metformin or GLP-1 agonist, and we may add some uh, SNG2 inhibitors or DPP-2 inhibitors. And for hyper uh, how to control blood pressure, AC inhibitor is still the first choice therapy. So of course, uh, I do think that uh, revascularization and medical therapy is not enough. We do need very good food care, like growth factor injection, minor imputation if you can, Go plasma injection, a very good wound care, and a very good re rehabilitation program. So we do need a lot of lot of works uh, to provide uh, the best outcome for the patient with peripheral artery disease. So you can see a patient in my place here. I I don't think that any drugs can provide um, the outcome like this. We do need a lot a lot of uh, food care for this patient. So in conclusion, um, I do think that for uh, the good uh, strategy for peripheral artery disease, including good screening for early in detection, we do need a hard team discussion uh, to discuss with intervention or bypass is better. We need food care and optimal medication is in include aspirin, low dose river saban, good diabetes control, good lipid control, and good uh, blood pressure control. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. That was a really important and, and well put study um, to show us the the reason why we're really here today talking about what we're, we're trying to do, isn't it? Trying to improve those outcomes for our peripheral artery disease patients. One of the things that strikes me so much is the, the graph that we see of the ongoing risk that patients with PAD have throughout the rest of their life. And it gets me every single time. Um, I, I wondered, there's a few questions that I had for you around medical therapy and risk prevention, and you presented a lot on that. Um, do you think that we need to adapt the guidelines to um, tailor to the needs of patients in the Asia Pacific region compared to the patients that we see in Europe or the US? Uh, yes, thank you so much for your questions. So, um, I, I think that uh, now we do need more aggressive um, approach for patients with uh, vessel disease, but I think we do we need to appreciate that the patient in the Asia Pacific population will have very higher risk of bleeding compared to patients in the Western countries. Maybe they have smaller, older, I, I don't know, but uh, the risk of bleeding is higher. It, 
that there's some data showing that. So we need to adapt the new guidelines, but with very good cautions, and we need very good monitor of the patient. I think as we get more information in post-market release of drugs such as um, the rivaroxaban in, in the Asian population, we'll be, be able to get a sense of what we yeah. need to change to. Um, and I guess reflecting on Dr. Adiato's presentation and the higher rates of diabetes, which are driving PAD, that sugar control is a really important part of the medical therapy too. Yeah. I just want to make a comment, if I may. Uh, you know, the prescription rate when it comes to antiplatelets and, and um, statins have been quite poor. You know, there's mm. data from the Chinese and the Koreans. Um, and it's no different here in Singapore. You know, we can, we can give them a script. It has all the, all the names of the, all the medications, but somehow they're not taking it. Um, and I, I can see from your presentation that it seems like diabetes is something that we should really get on top of, especially with an A1C less than seven. So I think my question would be, um, even though we're cardiologists, how aggressive should we be uh, in trying to be the, play the role of an endocrinologist and, and focus on that first, as opposed to um, the other pits, or the, the other risk factors? Yes, um, as a cardiologist, I don't think that it can be a good cardiologist without the um, enough knowledge about how to treat diabetes patient. And uh, we, we need to educate ourselves. We need to update ourselves about the new IDA guidelines and now the new guidelines from Diabetes Association to, say, to see how it's going on. And, yeah. it, it, and it's the same for the endocrinologists. They need uh, knowledge about how to treat cardiovascular diseases. So uh, you see how, your question is that how, how, how we should control the diabetes? Oh, I'm just saying as a cardiologist, should we be the ones driving and trying to prescribe these medicines to control their A1C less than seven? The alternative would be to refer them to an endocrinologist. Uh, I, I, actually, I, I prescribe myself. And if I see that um, the patient has some... Uh, side effect if the patient cannot be able to tolerate the medication or if I cannot get the target A1C, I may refer to my endocrinologist. Okay. I guess that leads to a question that the rest of the panel might want to contribute to as well is that what are the model, how are our models of care for managing PAD patients changing in light of this very multidisciplinary need to be yeah yeah that, that's true. I love the fact that you brought out foot care because it brings in the role of the podiatrist and, and wound care as well. Thank you. Is there any questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. I think that was an excellent summary. Um, and thank you to both of our speakers so far. It's been a really informative talk. Um, Peter. Yes, so with that, I will go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Kumar Ganeson from um, from, he's an interventional cardiologist who works in Malaysia. And he will talk to us about the role of DOAC in lower extremity PAD implications after Compass and Voyager PAD. And I have to admit, you know, the, 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 these data came out quite a few years ago. And every time I hear to talk about it, I'm still learning new things. So with that, please go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Peter. A very good day, everyone. I uh, got my lecture pre-recorded. I'll just wait for it to be played. Yeah, thank you. A very good day, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you again for the kind introduction. I'm Kumara from the National Heart Institute, and I'm here to speak on the role of direct oral anticoagulants or DOACs in lower extremity peripheral artery disease, the implications after the COMPASS and Voyager PAD studies. So this uh, peripheral artery disease doesn't just happen in uh, isolation.
is defined as acute limb ischemia requiring intervention including thrombectomy and thrombolysis and major amputation at or above the ankle with the need for surgical peripheral revascularization. So from this compared study, as you can see, those patients who experienced a male event had a significantly higher mortality and a far higher vascular amputation risk too. So several clinical trials have investigated the efficacy and safety of antiplatelet therapy in patients with peripheral artery disease, but most of them show mixed results. Importantly, apart from the Euclid trial, data for the efficacy and safety of antiplatelet therapy in patients with PAD are based on subgroup analysis. There was no real uh, uh, studies to show that antiplatelet therapy or, or, or intensive antiplatelet therapy had any benefits. Although the subgroup analysis showed some benefits in terms of MACE, risk reduction in such as in charisma and pegasus the euclid trial showed no benefit of intensifying antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelo versus clopidogrel in patients with symptomatic peripheral artery disease either in terms of maze or male outcomes now uh, these are previous trials which have shown that treatment with antithrombotic therapy after lower extremity bypass surgery have not shown efficacy and actually have demonstrated an unacceptable bleeding risk Rivaroxaban and aspirin, they work synergistically and they target essential components of atherothrombosis to provide vascular protection. So thrombin plays a central role in thrombus formation, triggering both fibrin formation and platelet activation. So platelets and coagulation are in fact closely linked, given the substantial thrombin generation occurs in prothrombinase complexes on the platelet surface. So activated factor 10 is a vital component in the generation of thrombin. Hence, factor 10A inhibition with rivaroxaban would impact not only on fibrin formation, but also platelet activation. So what do the guidelines say? Well, this is from the current ESC guidelines for treatment of peripheral artery disease, basically recommending treatment for symptomatic peripheral artery disease. So this was published in 2017 and uh, it recommends antithrombotic therapies in patients with peripheral artery disease. Single antiplatelet therapy is recommended for all patients with symptomatic PAD and dual antiplatelet therapy is recommended only for a limited period of time after certain revascularization procedures. Interestingly, we are seeing some changes to the current guidelines, the 2019 ESVM guidelines to the, the 2019 Global Vascular Guidelines on the Management of Critical Life-Threatening Ischemia and the 2019 ESC EASD Guidelines on Diabetes, Pre-Diabetes and Cardiovascular Disease. Basically, all three guidelines advocate the use of combination therapy of aspirin 100 mg daily and low-dose rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD for patients with significant peripheral artery disease without uh, contraindications or high bleeding risk. So with what we have seen so far, there is a pressing need to address patients with atherothrombosis. Current standard of care uh, using antiplatelet therapy is generally not considered sufficient. Prevention of cardiovascular and limb events in stable peripheral artery disease is not fully established with current standard of care. Dual antiplatelet therapy is even less established after revascularization. There's a high and increasing medical need in patients with PAD. There's an urgent need to establish new or added on treatment in patients with this high uh, risk group. And uh, new evidence suggests reduction in maize, male and hospitalization for acute peripheral artery disease related events. Now let's look at the COMPASS study in detail. Basically, this uh, study randomized 27,000 over patients with coronary disease and peripheral artery disease worldwide. Uh, it was conducted in 33 countries with 602 sites and what is noteworthy is that there is a good number of uh, patients from the Asia uh, Pacific region with uh, good representation in this study. So this is a dual pathway approach. Basically the objective was to determine the efficacy and safety of rivaroxaban, low dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin or aspirin alone for redu reducing the risk of myocardial infarction stroke and cardiovascular death in patients with coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease. So uh, 27,395 patients were randomized to three groups. 
rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD with aspirin in one arm, another arm with rivaroxaban 5 mg BD alone, and at the final arm of aspirin 100 mg alone uh, with a 30-day washout period, and the average follow-up 23 months at early termination of study. So uh, basically, this study, the, the, the antithrombotic investigations, were stopped at one year ahead of expectations in February 2017 due to overwhelming efficacy in the rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD plus aspirin arm. So this COMPASS study included over 7,000 patients with symptomatic peripheral artery disease or concomitant CAD and PAD. All patients with PAD, there are almost 7,470. Those who were symptomatic were about 4,000 plus. 1,900 with carotid disease and 1,422 patients with coronary artery disease and asymptomatic peripheral artery disease, but a significant uh, ABI or less than 0 0.9. So these are the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Basically, I think most of us are familiar with that. So looking at the baseline characteristics, uh, they were basically consistent across the treatment arms and in line with those usually seen in patients with peripheral artery disease, uh, most of them were in the 60s uh, age group, a uh, good number of uh, smokers, uh, patients with diabetes, hypertension, prior coronary artery disease, prior stroke, uh, those who are on lipid lowering and ACE inhibitors or ARB treatment. So this is the outcome. Basically, the rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD plus aspirin group significantly reduced maize and male versus aspirin alone in patients with chronic PAD in the COMPASS study. Uh, there was a 28% uh, uh, relative risk reduction in stroke and CV death and a 46% relative risk reduction in male, including major amputation. So in the chronic Peripheral artery disease population using rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD and aspirin significantly reduce both cardiovascular and limb events, including amputations, compared to aspirin alone. So if you look at the pre-specified PAD outcomes, there was a 28% reduction in maize, 46% reduction in male, and a, a, a great 70% reduction in major amputations. 60% reduction in all vascular amputations and a good 31% reduction in maize or male or major amputation. And uh, the dual path inhibition uh, or DPI with uh, rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD and aspirin demonstrated a clear benefit across all subgroups, uh, be it race or geographic region, whether there was tobacco use, patients were diabetic, hypertensive or had dyslipidemia. So how about bleeding rates? Well, bleeding rates were increased but low with no differences seen in fatal and intracranial bleeding. From the first part of the graph, you can see an absolute risk increase of 1.2% in major bleeding, but there was very few cases of fatal bleeding, intracerebral hemorrhage and critical organ bleeding. What is noteworthy here is that the increased bleeding with rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD with aspirin occurred mostly in the first year the incidence of bleeding progressively got less with subsequent years. Well, this slide needs to be looked at a bit carefully. So rivaroxaban plus aspirin did not significantly increase fatal or critical organ bleeds. Uh, basically, the incidence was low uh, when you look at the fatal bleeding, symptomatic critical organ bleeds presented with bleeding recurring hospitalization and those who require transfusion within 48 hours. Okay, so if you look at the in totality, uh, there was a reduction in uh, all-cause mortality from rivaroxaban vascular dose plus aspirin. Uh, there was a relative risk reduction of 23% compared and an absolute risk reduction of 0.9%. And uh, if you look at the other agents in uh, like aspirin, only gives a 9% reduction for all-cause mortality, ACE inhibitor 14%, and lipid lowering therapy with one millimole reduction gives you a 9% reduction in all-cause mortality. But if you use the dual pathway inhibition with rivaroxaban vascular dose 2.5 mg BD plus aspirin, it gives a good 23% reduction in all-cause mortality. 
and the balance between the increase in bleeding events and reduction in may suggest a net clinical benefit over time. So the increase in major bleeding and GI bleeding with eroxaban was confined to the first year of randomization with no significant excess bleeding thereafter. And in contrast, the benefit of rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD plus aspirin in preventing CV death, stroke or MI and mortality were consistent over time. So ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion from the COMPASS trial, we have seen that rivaroxaban and aspirin is the only therapeutic option so far to reduce cardiovascular and limb events including amputations in patients with chronic peripheral artery disease. Moving forward, ladies and gentlemen, we'll quickly look at the Voyager PAD study. Basically, there was an unmet need. The optimal antithrombotic management after PAD revascularization was unknown. And uh, dual antiplatelet therapy after endovascular intervention is unproven, but standard practice mainly influenced by coronary artery disease treatment patterns. And there was some interesting initial data on Varapaxa, but uh, it was shown to increase risk of bleeding. So we're still searching for the best way to care for post-revascularization in patients with peripheral artery disease. Keeping that in mind, we have the Voyager PAD study, uh, basically looking at whether rivaroxaban in combination with aspirin improves limb and systemic outcomes in high-risk PAD patients undergoing lower extremity revascularization. The Voyager PAD study basically randomized 6,564 patients worldwide. It was conducted in 542 sites in 34 countries. And the Asian countries uh, include China, Taiwan, Thailand, Japan, and South Korea. The Voyager PAD study was designed as a PAD intervention study. Uh, patients with symptomatic peripheral artery disease undergoing peripheral revascularization were randomized to either rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD and aspirin or aspirin 100 mg alone. Basically, the objective was to test whether tivaroxaban 2.5 mg uh, daily added to low-dose aspirin reduces the risk of major adverse limb and cardiovascular events compared to aspirin alone and also to evaluate the safety using the same uh, therapy. And uh, randomization was stratified according to the type of revascularization procedure. Symptomatic PAD patients who are undergoing peripheral intervention uh, were stratified by procedure and clopidogrel use, either surgical, endovascular with clopidogrel, or endovascular uh, intervention without clopidogrel. And uh, if you look at the previous subgroup of patients with critical limb ischemia at almost 1,533 patients or almost 23% of the total population studied. And these are the inclusion exclusion criteria. Basically, patients had to have documented moderate to severe symptomatic PAD with all of the following uh, features. Ischemic symptoms, basically functional limitation, rest pain or ischemic ulceration and imaging evidence of peripheral artery disease and an abnormal ABI. And uh, they had to undergo successful lower extremity revascularization for ischemia. And these are the key exclusion criteria. Now, basically looking at the outcomes of efficacy, primarily acute limb ischemia, major amputation for vascular cause, or myocardial infarction, ischemic stroke, or CV death. And these are the other secondary outcomes. Basically, safety, you're looking at TME major bleeding and ISTHM, ISTH major bleeding or box uh, 3B or above bleeding events. Basically, the baseline demographics were well balanced between the randomized treatment groups in terms of age, sex, uh, race, diabetes, current smoking, COPD, renal failure, coronary artery disease, prior MI or known keratostenosis. And there was also equal use of clopidogrel, statin, and ACE ARP in both groups. And uh, the baseline demographics were also balanced between the randomized treatment groups. Looking at the PAD and procedural characteristics too, there was no difference in both the randomized groups. In terms of prior peripheral artery disease history, indication for revascularization, and the type of revascularization which was performed. Looking particularly at the endovascular revascularization uh, group, 
basically there was no difference between the two groups whether in terms of use of endovascular uh, approach balloon angioplasty drug coated balloons or bare metal stands covered stands use of atherectomy and even a hybrid approach in terms of surgical revascularization there was also no difference between the two arms so what did the yjpd study show basically rivaroxaban uh, vascular dose plus aspirin significantly reduced the risk of composite uh, primary endpoint by 15 percent versus aspirin alone there was a 15 percent relative risk reduction uh, with uh, a number of needed treat over three years was only 39 and if we look at the voyager pad study uh, it was not just something which was a short term as you can see the both the lines are diverging and uh, the number, the, the absolute risk reduction was 1.5% at six months. At one year, it was 2%, and at three years, it was 2.6%. So it looks like there is a sustained benefit of using the, the, uh, comp the combination of low dose rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD with aspirin versus just aspirin alone. So, how about bleeding? Well, the principal safety outcome was major bleeding and uh, Basically, in this study, there was no significant excess in the principal safety outcome of TIMI major bleeding with rivaroxaban. There was a significantly higher incidence of the secondary safety outcome of ISTH major bleeding. However, there was no excess in intracranial hemorrhage or fatal bleeding. So basically, the Voyager PAD study demonstrated a sustained benefit with dual pathway inhibition therapy versus standard of care. Uh, the primary endpoint uh, composite of acute limb ischemia, major amputation or vascular cause or MI and stroke event was definitely reduced. So the Voyager PAD results suggest that rivaroxaban 2.5 mg and low-dose aspirin can be initiated post-revascularization after achieving hemostasis to provide early and long-term benefit in terms of limb and CV benefits. So dual pathway inhibition uh, therapy is the first antithrombotic regimen uh, proven to offer significant benefit after peripheral revascularization in a large randomized clinical trial so far. And uh, this is basically, the, I'm at the end of my presentation, basically who, when and how do we start dual pathway inhibition in peripheral artery disease. Basically patients who have symptomatic PAD with high MACE risk would benefit the most, those with concomitant coronary artery disease, type 2 diabetes mellitus, other renal impairment, or patients with high male risk prior revascularization or presenting with critical limb ischemia, and uh, uh, preferably patients who are not at high uh, bleeding risk, those who need therapeutic anticoagulation, who have had a prior stroke or intracerebral hemorrhage, or history of having uh, hospitalization for major bleeding. These are probably patients who are uh, best excluded. When do you start it? Well, post-intervention after hemostasis within about 10 days, and it can also be done at the vascular clinic prior to revascularization and uh, to monitor patency. And for patients who are just being seen at the preventive care clinic, those with high MACE risk profile or high male risk profile can we also be considered for dual pathway inhibition using the Roxaban 2.5 mg BD and aspirin of 100 mg. And how do you do it? Well, basically like how we do it for other, other uh, treatment modalities, educate the patient, the risk of mace and male, the outcomes of limb events and the safety that we have seen with the, with the studies. And assess other medications was uh, we are using low dose aspirin. Uh, do the patients need uh, the P2Y12 uh, or is there any certain duration that they need to be on? Uh, the Voyager PAD actually supports adding on top of dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, is there a need for anticoagulation for other indications and inform other providers uh, we should educate our fellow uh, team members as to you know, the role of uh, low dose rivaroxaban the indication the duration and and how to deal with it if there is any uh, problem especially bleeding so uh, in summary what we can see from both the compass and the voyager pad study is that from acute intervention to long-term secondary prevention, uh, the rivaroxaban 2.5 mg BD and aspirin low dose reduces the risk of major adverse limb and cardiovascular outcomes. 
basically it can be used in the acute post revascularization phase and then continued in the chronic phase and uh, this has been, the studies have shown less maze less male less amputations less unplanned revascularization and less vascular hospitalizations with that thank you very much ladies and gentlemen for your kind attention Okay, thank you so much for that very comprehensive uh, review of very two uh, important trials. For I just want to, since we have most of us are here now, um, I'd like to just pull um, the, the people who do these peripheral interventions. How many of you have actually started giving rivaroxaban post procedure? Can you show your hand? Yeah, okay, okay. Uh oh. I see Dr. Soga did not raise his hand. <laughs> that, that's not the reading verse in Japan. As, oh, not the in Japan. Okay. No. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so back to uh, the, uh, can I just ask, how would you uh, assess a patient for bleeding risk before you put them on um, rivaroxaban? I mean, as cardiologists, we use Hasblad um, for, for sort of bleeding risk in terms of starting for atrial fibrillation. Is that something you use as well? Yeah, thanks, Dr. Peter. I think that's a, a very valid question. I think the biggest challenge in using uh, DOEX in patients with both uh, atrial fibrillation or peripheral artery disease is the bleeding risk. So the message here is, is for the listeners is to, to more than the indication, it should be the contraindication. I think the mm. studies have shown us that, that the, the benefits are clear uh, it's first do no harm. So we'll have to choose our patients carefully. Like how Dr. Lin has, men uh, uh, Lin has mentioned earlier, uh, the, the, the treatment has to be tailor-made for each and every patient. So in my practice, as, as much as we would like to trust the data, uh, I am quite selective on the patients that I put on uh, low-dose rivaroxaban, mainly because of the bleeding risk. And uh, there are many models available. Hasblad is something that we are familiar with. So I'm quite happy to use that uh, as an initial tool to screen my patient as to whether they would benefit or would they have issues with uh, anticoagulation. Okay. I think it's important to point out that they didn't use Hasblad as their screening tool in the yeah. Compass yeah. or in the Voyager trial. And so it is challenging translating a bleeding tool that was designed for something else into this mm -hmm. patient cohort as well. Um, I guess that's another implementation challenge, isn't it, Dr. Kumra, where we, we have to not only overcome our own um, concerns about potentially causing bleeding, but encourage our patients that that bleeding risk is, is low. And in your last slide, you talked about having a plan in place for how to manage bleeding if it occurred. And I wondered if you could elaborate a bit on what you do um, to give your patients that security that they're being cared for if this happens. Yeah, I don't think uh, we have a very solid plan in place it's more like hoping that it doesn't happen. And, and one of those things that we do to reduce the risk of at least upper GI breeze is to give it with a proton pump inhibitor. I know it's not part of the protocol in the studies, but it is something that we routinely do, especially when the patient is on an antiplatelet therapy and anti uh, 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 DOAC. So that's something that we do. And, and uh, we, we see them regularly. We have a dedicated uh, peripheral clinic uh, and, and most of these patients are seen on a one to three monthly period, depending on their status. And uh, most of the time we tell them that if they, if they have any bleeding uh, episodes, if they no, notice that their stools are turning uh, blackish or, or they don't, just don't feel unwell, that they come early. Uh, most of the time, if it's a non-life-threatening bleeding, we just stop the DOAC and uh, we observe and optimize the hemoglobin, uh, whether they need transfusion or not. Uh, if, if, if it's really a, a very life-threatening bleeding, I don't think there's nothing much that can be done, uh, especially if it's an intracerebral bleed, the outcome is going to be very poor. So that's where the main challenge is. Uh, and, and that's where we have to spend time to discuss with not just the patient, but the family members as to the benefits that we hope to achieve with the medication. At the same time, it's, uh, we have weighed the pros and cons. We have actually seen that you know, the risk is worth taking. So as long as the patient and the family understands, I think... Uh, that's something that we can consider for most of our PAD patients.
Yeah, I think one of the highlights too of the Voyager PAD protocol was that the river rock span was not started immediately after the procedure, uh, but um, to, to first make sure that there's good hemostasis. And I think it was started within, within seven days, if not, I'm not mistaken. So which kind of put us in a bind, right? From, from, uh, from the day, post-op day one, I think, I guess you would put them on a DAPT, but somewhere along the line, do you then add the river rock span on top of the DAPT or you do, do you switch them out? You know, when, okay, when that's you a very on. good practical question. So this is how we do it. So we usually see our patients in about a month after procedure. So I, I, I know the Voyager PED study show that it should be started within a, a week, but I, I traditionally we use DAPT for about a month and then switch it over to single antiplatelet and rivaroxaban at the clinic if the okay. patient has got no issues and uh, the bleeding rate is deemed to be low. Okay. So, so we don't really follow the Voyager PED study to the word, but this is a bit of a modified protocol that we use. We started at the one month review at clinic. Mm. It's a little bit better with our practice of discharging patients the same day or, or within a short time period from hospital as well, which is challenging to bring them back to give them some separate new medication in a week. Mm. Yeah, um, well, I might, might keep our discussion moving on and thank you to everybody so far. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Yoshimitu Soga from Japan. Let me just share our screen here. Um, so Dr. Sogo is the director of the Kokura Memorial Hospital in Fukuoka. Um, and I've probably completely butchered the pronunciation. I apologize, Dr. Sogo, but we'll hand over to you to give your presentation now. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for thank you for kind good uh, introduction. Uh, okay, uh, I'd like to share with my slide. Uh, give me some second. You see the slide. Do you hear my voice? Yes. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thanks. Uh, it's great honor to be here to present my presentation. My name is Soga. I'm interventional cardiologist. Uh, so usually I treated well the coronary artery as well as uh, peripheral artery disease. So today uh, I'd like to focus on the uh, CLI BDK intervention the challenging and the breakthrough. Uh, before talking my topics, how long does it take to achieve the complete healing? So usually uh, three to four months is needed to achieve the complete healing, even in the uh, short ganglion, the Rutherford class five or Rutherford, uh, Rutherford class six. Then, but however, restenosis rate is much higher. So in Japan, so for infrapapito, uh, the three months restenosis after the bone angioplasty for infrapapito disease was uh, 82% of the segment analysis. Uh, therefore, uh, almost all lesion uh, treated with the bone angioplasty alone uh, occurred the restenosis within the three months. But three or four, four months is needed to achieve the complete healing. Therefore, repeat revascularization is needed. Uh, then, so some concept uh, to uh, get more effective way, uh, uh, some concept uh, is uh, shown here. The first is a one straight line uh, from the proximal to the distal. Uh, the one straight line concept. Uh, another one is the angio zone concept uh, the, to the wound heel, uh, the toe, uh, so selectively, so the target vessel uh, uh, should be open by angio zone concept. So additionally, uh, below the ankle angioplasty, uh, as well as uh, below the knee angioplasty, 
So uh, more distal open uh, is needed to achieve the complete healing. Uh, but one more thing, so I uh, add one more thing, uh, it's IVERS. IVERS is a very uh, interesting device. Uh, some reported, uh, the Dr. Fujihara reported that the IVERS tells us the build a knee vessel uh, seems to be much bigger than expected uh, than the angiographic vessel. So as you can see, uh, the TPT trunk is around four millimeter. The ADA proximal is a 3.5. The mid uh, one is 3.1. The distal side is a 2.8. Uh, therefore, the, this paper has a, including the two important things. The one is uh, much bigger than expected. The second is a uh, uh, TBR artery is ta tapering, tapering. Uh, therefore, a uh, taper bone is more effective, I think. Uh, anyway, uh, from in my institution, the same analysis was occurred. Uh, the BK vessel diameter is 1.2 to 1.3 times uh, larger uh, than it appears. Uh, so therefore, uh, here, uh, I, I was finding show us the uh, below that knee vessel uh, seems to be bigger. I will show you the case. Uh, he is a CLTI patient. Uh, so target vessel is a ADA. So from angiographic analysis, QB analysis, the proximal ADA diameter is 3.2. The mid is a 2.4. Uh, the distal side is a 1.9. Uh, therefore, for, from the angio base uh, EVT, so we need to choose the 2.5 or uh, something. However, from the IVERS findings, the reference vessel is much bigger. So for the proximal 4.4, the uh, inner lumen is a 2.4, 2.5. So same uh, like uh, angio, but the reference vessel was much bigger, 3.6, this uh, as well, 3.0. Uh, therefore, so two, two kind of treatment, the angio guide uh, balloangioplasty or IVERS guide angioplasty. The initially, first, so I treated with the angio guide angioplasty. So I treated with a 2.5 balloangio uh, balloon. Uh, the result is not so bad, it looks so nice. But I believe the IVAS findings, I treated with a four millimeter balloon uh, from the ADA. The, the final result is here. The result is excellent, uh, much better, I think. Uh, another one, uh, 89 year old male who had a CLTI with a tall ganglion. The target vessel is uh, ADA as well. Uh, the after the successful crossing the guide wire uh, based on the QB analysis, I treated with a 2.5 millimeter balloon uh, for the ADA to cover the whole lesion like this. Then uh, I checked the iris, but the iris tells us the ADA was four millimeter, uh, the whole basic. Therefore, uh, I treated with the four millimeter balloon for the ADA. The result is much nicer like this. Even, uh, even in the inframareola, uh, the below the ankle lesion, uh, the IVERS is effective, I think. Uh, so before starting the treatment, so below the ankle, the uh, pedal arch uh, was 1.5 millimeter uh, reference vessel. Uh, therefore, I gently treated with a 1.5 millimeter balloon. After that, so it looks so nice. Then I check the iris. Iris tells me uh, 2.5, uh, this reference vessel. Uh, therefore, I treated with a 2.5. Uh, after that, a much nicer result was found here. Uh, there, uh, however, so iris guide and vascular procedures uh, is really much better than the uh, angio guide EVG 
that I have no idea, so no uh, good report. Uh, therefore, I investigate by myself. Uh, can Ivers improve the Ivers, uh, outcome in CLT a patient uh, undergoing the balloon angioplasties? So, you know, as you, you know, in Japan, so we have no DCB, no DES, no stent for the below the ankle, just only have the balloon angioplasty. Uh, therefore, so for CLTI patient with uh, isolate the infrapalpital lesion were enrolled in this analysis retrospectively, retrospectively uh, I analyzed the effectiveness uh, of the uh, IVAS guide and the vascular procedure. The result is here. So overall uh, outcome is here. The so primary endpoint uh, was a ring salvage without any intervention. So IVAS guide, uh, uh, balloonangioplasty is a red line. The blue line is, a, uh, 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 sorry, uh, blue line is angio guide. The red line is Ivers guide EVT for infrapalpital lesion. So uh, in the overall analysis, so Ivers guide EVT seems to be much better uh, outcome. So in Rutherford class four, the Rutherford class five, uh, uh, there is a significant difference in, between the IVERS guide and the uh, angio guide and the rather for the class five. Uh, so especially reintervention rate dramatically reduced in the uh, IVERS guide ABT. The Here is a subgroup analysis. So uh, uh, the, in terms of the complete wound healing, uh, the both group uh, uh, was not differ, uh, that did not differ in the both group. So wound healing rate is the same. The, however, the left graph, uh, wound healing rate uh, was much earlier in the Ivers guided group. Uh, how long, how much earlier in the uh, mean side of the graph? So, uh, time to wound healing in the Ivers guided group is uh, uh, nearly three months. And uh, the time to wound healing in the angio guided group uh, was four months. Uh, therefore, uh, the Ivers guided PTA uh, can shorten the uh, two to four weeks uh, to achieve the complete healings. There, then uh, the total number of endovascular procedure was reduced uh, significantly. So maybe two to two times, and then and you guided two to three. Uh, this investigation is a very, very simple uh, analysis. The pink outcome uh, was much better than the yellow outcome. And therefore, so the risk diagnosis is a mandatory. Uh, it's unavoidable, but the, a bit longer, if you use a bit larger balloon, uh, therefore, uh, that findings may contribute to improve the CLTI outcome. However, it's not necessary to use the iris in all cases because iris is very expensive. So uh, therefore, so I, I uh, recommended uh, plus 0 0.5 millimeters uh, method. Uh, therefore, uh, as you can see the, from the annual findings, uh, we, when you think that this vessel is a 2.5, so plus 0 0.5 millimeters, so you can choose the three uh, millimeter balloon. Uh, these findings, uh, if you have, uh, yeah, I, I hope to be helpful uh, in your daily practice. So you can make a, a IVAS guide outcome. Then after the uh, revascularization, uh, the adjuvant therapy is a very important because uh, after the successful procedure, next day, uh, wound does not heal yet. Uh, therefore, uh, so, two months or three months adjuvant therapy uh, is continuously uh, performed in our institution. So mainly two kind of management. The first is 
is a pain management. Then the second is a wound management. Uh, I will show you the, some example. Uh, someone use the HBO, uh, HBO therapy, uh, or uh, carbon dioxide bus. Uh, it's a very easy to use the uh, carbon side bus. The, uh, additionally, uh, recently uh, in Japan, some patient uh, received the SCS uh, spinal cord stimulation to reduce the uh, sympathetic uh, nerve stimulation. Uh, so additionally, uh, I'd like to talk about the aphylaxis. After the endovascular procedure, uh, aphylaxis as an adjuvant therapy is a very useful and effective. I will show you the case, 90 year old male who had a, a dialysis patient and the target vessel is an anterior artery. After the uh, open the anterior artery, I remove the uh, ganglion, then I start the uh, aphylaxis because he is a dialysis patient, uh, no uh, additional exercise is needed. Then after two weeks later, uh, solely uh, Chinese character. So after two weeks later, uh, he was discharged. Then uh, he keep the aphylaxis, uh, keep going the aphylaxis in the dialysis clinic. Uh, then uh, one month later, two months later, so when the healing was achieved like this. Uh, this patient is a 68 year old male who had also a dialysis patient. Uh, the target uh, vessel is a posterior tibial artery. Uh, the, after the successful revascularization, I started the uh, aphelesis therapy. Uh, the, after we move the uh, tour, uh, then four months later, uh, four weeks later, eight weeks later, the wound uh, gradually healed. Then he was discharged, then uh, keep the uh, athletic therapy on the, in the outpatient clinic. Another one, 66 year old man, uh, CLTI patient and the right toe that I treated with a uh, pranta artery. After success for the procedure, uh, I removed the toe that I keep the uh, aphelaxis uh, to a week, uh, up to three months, uh, the gradually. Uh, granulation was occurred to cover the uh, wood. Uh, here is the, this is the final slide and I have my take home message. So for CLTI patient, the endovascular procedure is still challenging, uh, but uh, I try to open much with much bigger size balloon, four millimeter, uh, Balangioplasty and uh, the breakthrough, uh, the breakthrough, the iris and the aphylaxis to manage the uh, CLTI patient. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Well, thank you, Dr. Soga, for 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 your presentation. I definitely learned something today. Um, your your body of your your body of work has really illustrated that. Perhaps I've been undertreating uh, these benoni vessels because uh, I routinely keep my 4mm for the TP trunk. Um, mm -hmm. for, and it's always a bit uh, nerve wracking for me to use something that big um, and the, and the, in the proximal region of any uh, interior TPO. But um, I think I saw the, some green light on this based on your presentation. Um, so just from a practical standpoint, would you go straight to, okay, in, in absence of an IVUS, would you go straight to a big size balloon like a four, uh, or would you want to do a three and then a four? Uh, optimal size is a three point five. Okay. Optimal size three point five, uh, but 
uh, we have in, in Japan. So longer 3.5 balloon is not available, commercially available. Uh, therefore, so I usually use a four, longer four millimeter balloon uh, with a low pressure okay. for the below the knee. And, and how long are you leaving the inflation time for? Because um, the bigger balloons often have more recoil after you angioplasty. Uh, yeah, that's a good question. So you usually two to three minutes mm -hmm. uh, within my tolerance. Within our, our patients. It's always <laughs> a long time, three minutes, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes um, I, too long. <laughs> What what proportion of patients are you using IVUS for and what proportion are you using the IVUS guided larger balloon sizes without IVUS? Uh, uh, so I uh, come again, sorry. Sorry, it wasn't very clear. Um, how many of your patients do you routinely use IVUS for now? Uh, maybe uh, 30%. 30 bucks in entire below the knee artery. So, uh, previously, I used uh, nearly 100%. Uh, uh, yeah, but sometimes it does not cross uh, the very heavily calcified lesion. Uh, therefore, uh, so uh, at current situation, maybe 30 percent Because mm -hmm. I, I know that I was findings uh, from the many, many experience, uh, therefore, so it's not necessary to use the whole mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, but certainly, I think your findings would cost justify the use of IVUS in patients where you're going to get a much improved result and faster wound healing, which must have been good to find. Yeah, yeah. Can I ask if, some, if you don't see a proper wound, wound blush, would you then target your, your effort to the so-called the other vessels, any of the other, other two vessels? Uh, yeah, uh -oh. thank you very much. But basically, uh, I am thinking the, as many as possible theory. Mm -hmm. uh, therefore, uh, no, I, 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 I try to open as many as possible uh, mm -hmm. with my tolerance, within my trials. Okay, <laughs> which is how many how many hours? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one one to two hours. Okay, okay, uh, yeah. Um, can I just ask a question about the apheresis that you're using? Um, can you talk us through a little bit more about what what you're doing with that and um, how often you are, uh, are using thank you it? Thank very much. The uh, two times a week. Uh -huh. uh, one session is two hour uh, after the dialysis or before dialysis, uh, I, I introduced the uh, aphylaxis therapy. And are you focusing on particular cell lines or, or um, is it just general? Uh, it, uh, the brand name is a uh, rail kana. Okay. Rayo Kana, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I usually use a Rayo Kana yeah. uh, as an aphoresis. And only in your dialysis patients? Or uh, no? Yeah, so because access side is very limited, mm -hmm. uh, therefore, so for, dial, uh, for diabetes patient, the very effective, but access side is needed. Uh, therefore, the, after the discharge, it's it's not easy to keep the aphasis uh, therapy. Uh, therefore, so in the current situation, so in mainly I use for the dialysis patient. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. A very very interesting presentation, and I think we've all had a um, a good reflection on our own practice, and we'll be using some larger balloons moving forward. Yeah, try it. <laughs> larger, larger balloons first. The yeah. IVUS can come later. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I go ahead and introduce our next speaker. Our next speaker is, oh, one second. Oh, yeah. Our next speaker is Dr. Tamila.
Um, I'm sorry if I'm saying your name incorrectly because on the slides it says Timala, but I just noticed on your Zoom it says Timila. But uh, uh, our speaker is a, um, a surgeon who specializes in cardiothoracic and vascular surgery. Um, I always ask, I always tell my vascular surgical colleagues that they know nothing about small vessels, but I think our, our speaker here knows a lot about both. So he'll talk about surgical revascularization for critical limb ischemia in PAD, when, who, and how. I'm trying to share my screen. I'm sorry, there's some mistake here. Dr. Timila, in your share screen, there is a no PowerPoint. Would you maybe you need to find your PowerPoint first? Now, uh, in your screen, only yes. see uh, you may go to your uh, file management and just try to find your PowerPoint. You are sharing your screen. We can see your screen, but uh, there is a no PowerPoint uh, file opened. Okay. If you go to click on share screen, you can actually select which item you want to share. So maybe you re-click on that. My screen is, uh, Something happened. I think uh, you can go ahead with another uh, speaker. So by the time I, I, I can, I try to fix my own. Well, I, I can actually, I can actually stop your screen sharing. Yes. Uh, and uh, and do you want to try again? <laughs> and now you can share your screen, but mm -hmm. choose your PowerPoint instead. Shall we try that? I can stop and then now you can share your screen. Um, I'm sorry, nothing is happening. Mm. Yeah. Do you have your PowerPoint open? I, I do have my PowerPoint in the desktop, but I'm not seeing my own desktop. Um, okay. Um, sometimes if you just try starting your... Uh, give me a second, I'll call uh, one of my... <coughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Phone a friend. <laughs> I'm sorry, I think you can go ahead with another uh, presenter by the time I try to fix my. Is that okay? okay? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Fine, absolutely. we don't want to put pressure on you. <laughs> um, please, uh, uh, please stop sharing. So we will, I will... Oh, okay. I'm sorry for that. Okay. 
Okay. Um, well, I might introduce our second last speaker now, um, Dr. Dr. Fu Te Chang um, from the um, from Taiwan. Uh, who's going to be speaking to us on supervised exercise therapy in lower extremity peripheral artery disease. And this is to round off, we've gone from medical therapy and screening right through to um, endovascular therapy. We'll come back to surgical therapy in a minute, um, but our armamentarium in our, in our toolbox for treating PAD. So, so welcome, Dr. Fu. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I prepare my presentation by a preset video. Uh, please uh, play the video. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Fu Tie Cheng. I am delighted to be here today to talk to you about the supervised exercise therapy in lower extremity PAD. I will tell you who is adequate candidate, when is proper time, and how to practice the exercise therapy. According to a recent study, PAD affects more than 200 million people in the world and lead to around 9% mortality rate by all cause deaths. So, early diagnosis and intervention are important. The treatment for PAD including risk reduction, medical management, revascular regulation, and exercise intervention. Till now, there is little to support the advantage of exercise, endovascular or open revascularization versus each other in PAD treatment, particularly with regarding to mild to late term result. Systemic review suggests that exercise therapy is a class one of treatment recommendation with level A of evidence for patients with PAD. The positive effects of regular exercise for patients with PAD were first described in 1998. A meta-analysis in 1895 showed exercise training with supervised treadmill walking could improve pain-free walking distance by 179% and the much more walking distance by 122% in this PAD patient. In 2008, Another meta analysis of RCT demonstrated that exercise training program of 3 to 12 months duration improved maximum training or working time by an average of 5 minutes, correspond to a relative improve of 50 to 200 percent. In a recent review in 2018, training exercise therapy still showed to be consistently beneficial. Theoretically, the benefit of exercise may come from multiple factors, including the induction of angiogenesis, increased endothelial dependent vessel dilatation, reduced blood viscosity, even muscle morphology and the mitochondrial function, and so on, and then produce a summation effect of increase of oxygen delivery and uh, utilization and the decrease of inflammation which lead to the improvement of function and the CV risk factor. However, there are some obvious dissociation between them hemodynamics and the exercise capacity in PAD patients. For example, angioplasty lead to a significant improvement in ABI and only a modest gain in walking capacity. And the exercise training lead to a large increase in walking capacity with no change in ABI. Cardiac output doesn't change significantly after exercise training, even large increasing in working capacity. So, further comprehensive study is needed to investigate the underlying cause of exercise intolerance and the effect of exercise intervention in PAD patient. Following, I will tell how to implementation of supervised exercise therapy for PAD patient. First, who should do supervised exercise therapy? We use Fulton and the rough road classification to define the disease severity. No published data identify contraindication to supervised exercise in patients with symptomatic PAD. However, given the theoretical risk of deteriorated non-healing tissue loss, some guidelines advise against 
is access superior to revascularization. So patient with acute artery occlusion or metal invert or thrombosis in the critical limb ischemia with infection could be the contraindication of exercise therapy. Furthermore, asymptomatic PAD patient, the mortality rate is still higher than normal. So, even asymptomatic PAD patients should receive exercise therapy. Secondary, when should we start exercise therapy for PAD patient? As mentioned previously, some guidelines advise against exercise prepared to revascularization. Most of the article didn't mention the timing for exercise start. The only article is not in JAMA 2050 or RCD report. In the article, it said that within two to four weeks after the endovascular revascularization procedure, patients were enrolled in the supervised exercise program. In the West by source, we find a discharge instruction after peripheral artery bypass surgery of St. Luke Hospital. He said that it's better to start working after surgery. I think it means it's to start exercise after surgery as soon as possible. Data evaluating supervised exercise therapy in critical limb ischemia patients are lacking. There is clearly no consensus on the role and the timing of supervised exercise therapy after revascularization for CLI. An ongoing RCT is not for evaluating 12-week exercise rehabilitation after revascularization versus best medical therapy in CLI patients. However, its protocol did mention when the Exercise therapy start after revascularization at all. Before exercise program start, all patients should have a complete history taken for cardiovascular risk and a cardiovascular targeted physical examination. For possible contraindications such as tissue necrosis or acute artery infarction, peripheral pass, skin condition, and the temperature should be also be checked. The function status of PAD patient is need to be evaluated, including patients' exercise tolerance, measurement of the pain-free and the maximum walking distance using six-minute walking test or the Garner treadmill protocol before and after exercise program. This result also can be used as an effectiveness measurement of exercise therapy. Due to high risk of concomitant CD problem, the patient should be monitored for ischemia heart disease during the initial exercise test. Third, we should focus on how to do exercise in PAD patients. Here show the suggested exercise prescription principle by ACSM for PAD patients. We could prescribe various exercise programs by this table. Next, we will explain in detail in order with FITT prescription principle. In the view of exercise frequency, there have been no RCT to determine the effect of exercise station frequency or duration on walking ability in PAD. The current suggestion for exercise frequency is that supervised exercise programs should be incorporated twice or three times per week. The outcome of exercise three times per week is better than twice per week, but additional section did not appear to result in greater benefit. How to set the intensity of exercise prescription? The current suggestion is moderate intensity. There are two definitions of moderate intensity. First, is by the result of previous exercise tests. That is 40 to 60 percent of oxygen consumption reserve. Secondary, by perceived pain during exercise, that is 3 out of 4 on the claudication pain scale. Regarding the intensity of exercise intervention, some discussion focuses on high intensity use. A short-term, 8-week high intensity program 
result in significantly greater improvement in peak VO2 compared with the low intensity program. Conversely, the longer six months program lead to significant but similar benefit in both the high intensity and the low intensity group. As mentioned, the similar benefit obtained across both groups may have been obscured by longer duration of the SSS program. So, we believe that improvement in the high intensity group may have occurred much sooner. But this effect was masked by the longer program duration. So, it is generally stated that when the total volume of exercise is controlled, there is no difference in the improvement achieved with high intensity and the low intensity exercise. What about the claudication pain? It is better to be more short during training. Most protocols specify that exercise is initiated at an intensity that induces onset of claudication within 3 to 5 minutes and the moderate to moderate severe claudication within 8 to 10 minutes. A recent meta analysis found no difference in walking exercise in which participate walk to a mild claudication level compared with walking to severe claudication. But the latest study report that low intensity home based exercise that is to work at a pace without ischemia leg syndrome was significantly less effective than high intensity home based exercise that is work at a pace in leaking moderate to severe ischemia leg syndrome. In conclusion, more so during training may edit more physical improvement or training adaptation. But watch out, this discomfort may reduce adherence level. Next, how long should the patient training once the claudication occurred during the exercise? How long should he rest? Exercise section duration should include in total section time, time spent exercise, and the time spent resting. A previous meta analysis from that session lasts more than 30 minutes to 16 minutes were more beneficial. More recent meta analysis suggests that 30 minutes of exercise without improvement in walking distance similar to that of 60 minutes of exercise. And the improvement appeared to peak at 45 minutes. It is usually difficult for a patient to sustain continuous periods of exercise for a long time, particularly during the early stage of a program. So, in the initial state, 10 to 20 minutes of accumulated exercise might be feasible, and extend by 5 minutes for each training section up to the target time. No study were identified that specifically compare exercise work duration, that is the time to the prescribed level of gratification, related to the subsequent rest duration. Because the time it takes for gratification to subside differ among individuals, it is not possible to standardize rest periods in this population. Most of the published study prescribe the use of intermittent exercise to moderate moderately severe claudication interspersed with resting periods until the claudication subsides. Next is exercise type. In the popularity consideration, treadmill is still the most popular effective method. Cycling and the arm cranking exercise could be the alternative method, but less effectively compared to the treadmill. The role of resistance exercise is still under debate. Only a small number of trials have systemically studied the effect of resistance exercise on working ability in PAD, and the findings today have been conflicted. No study was identified that have directly compared different 
Procreation Proposal of Exercise Procreation for Cloudication Rehabilitation. More study increased exercise volume by alternating increasing in duration and the workload. Because no study have investigated optimal rate of progression of exercise in exercise training for patients in PAD, it is prudent to increase the exercise volume at a rate more fast than every one to two weeks. In contrast to a cardio rehab, which prolong exercise duration as the first choice of progression. In PAD patients, we chose to increase the workload by increasing the credit of speed of treadmill as the progression. Usually, it will reduce the exercise duration initially due to earlier muscle soreness, but it will become longer Secretly, as we continue the training program. About the total goals, current recommendation suggests a duration of at least 12 weeks, but the goal is to complete at least 6 months of exercise training. The effect of treadmill exercise training on working performance has been shown to occur as soon as 6 weeks after the start of the program, and the response is greater at 12 weeks. This effect seems to be maintained for more than one year. Whether exercise therapy needs to be monitored in the hospital or can be done at home, this may be the hardest topic in PAD rehabilitation apart from exercise intensity. We combine the results of two famous studies in one graph. Obviously, the home program is effective, but not as good as the supervised exercise therapy in the hospital. The benefits of a home-based exercise program are easy implementation and accessibility, but the most important thing is to consider compliance issue, whenever it is regularity, intensity, or duration. This is the suggested home program prescription. Finally, some special consideration for patients with PAD and the intermittent complication should be known. Patients with PAD are at a high risk of other CV disease, so the EKG monitor is needed in exercise therapy practice. And then, peripheral neuropathy affects some patients with PAD, particularly those with DM, and this may be negatively affect their balance. Falling down extent should be avoided. The final is a cold environment may deteriorate the symptom of intermittent claudication. Therefore, a longer walk-up may be necessary. There are several obstacles for supervised exercise therapy implementation. First is lack of interest. Second is inconvenience. Third is lack of reimbursement, and so on. Finally, Let's share my experience in PAD study. We use near infrared spectroscopy to monitor the tissue oxygenation during exercise and PAD. We found that in some blood vessel that may be impaired vessel dilatation function. The recovery of blood flow during exercise recovery is significantly worse than other vessels. Of course, this hypothesis suggests in some study that it may be related to the recovery or function. Exercise induced ROS increasing in mass skeletal muscle per mode and increasing in NF kappa B and the PG1 1 alpha and the in MRPK activity in skeletal muscle fiber. Thereby increasing mitochondria biogenesis and the mitophage. However, excess ROS accumulation causes pathologic oxidative stress which impair protein in the lipid function contribute to genomic instability, damage membrane integrity, and inhibits their function in the survival. So I think how to adjust the training intensity talent for individual demand still need for the work. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Fu. That was a really 
probably the, one of the most comprehensive reviews of exercise therapy that I've seen in a long time. So um, thank you for compiling all of that. Um, one of the things that struck me as um, I was reflecting on your talk was I'd been speaking to some surgeons in Singapore who spoke about how none of their patients go outside for a walk because it's it's too hot and too humid. And I wonder how you've adapted your exercise therapy um, prescriptions to the local environment in Taiwan. In Sydney, we tell them to go for a walk or outside, and but I don't think that it's it's possible everywhere. Uh, I think uh, you you were a problem, and I think uh, in in north north of Taiwan the weather is so uh, wet and uh, rain is often raining in the uh, in the winter, so. Mm -hmm. So uh, we always we always um, suggest patients to do supervised exercise therapy in hospital. And home program is not well implementation in Taiwan because the compliance of the elderly is poor. Mm. Um, so we sometimes uh, suggest them to do uh, the exercise in gym, but the, that is a limit in the younger patient. That's, that is my opinion. I think it's very interesting to think about how the environment contributes to the compliance of our patients as well. Yeah. And I think there's also the competing... Uh, pathologies, right? Like, for example, your arthritis or back pain. And so for somebody to come into a program and, and sort of being put on the treadmill, for example, uh, could be quite a challenge. Mm -hmm. Can I just ask, at what point do you throw in the towers, towel and just say, hey, you know, this is not working? Do you, do you commit them to three months or do you write it up and go to six months before you do any sort of intervention for life dis disabling complications. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Uh... Uh, so, so I think that the, the the question is: Do you do you do this program for six months, or do you do it do you do it three months or less in somebody who is having a lot of symptoms? Uh, just uh, we mimic the exercise program in. In cardiac rehab, so uh, we try to uh, let um, this patient uh, do the exercise program for uh, thirty six section. So, okay. mm, because uh, but but the drop rate drop rate is higher than heart patient. In 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 fact, the PAD patient. The the the, com the complaints of PAD patient is uh, is so impaired. I I I in in my opinion, uh, about the drop rate about uh, in this population is about uh, more than fifty. Yeah. Do you use an exercise program after endovascular therapy for your patients as well? Mm. Do you put them on supervised exercise after a stent? Oh, okay. The, uh, after after stent or or uh, surgical revascularization, we always invite them to join our uh, program about um, one month later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, the. the but uh, if they have uh, ulceration or the active wound, then that will exclude my my plan. So uh, when I see the the other speaker, they have oh, so much tissue 
提取肉之后 ，I I I'm so scared. <laughs> Because, because in in my in my center, the 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 patient is so uh the, the condition of this patient is more gentle. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I th in Sydney we have a mix as well. <laughs> Not all terrible tissue loss, but yeah. um, I think it's being select selecting the right patients for exercise, like you had in one of your slides, is very important. Yeah. Uh, I agree. Um, final question on that. Do you have an exercise physiologist or a physiotherapist that runs your exercise program for you? Who, who runs the exercise supervised exercise program? Is it a physiotherapist or an exercise physiologist? Oh, okay. Uh, the the exercise test is uh, come uh, is is direct by the uh, by the doctor physiatrist physiatrist and the exercise training program is supervised by physical therapist in mm -hmm. my center. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's cool. But shall we go back to our our um, our previous speaker? Are you ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right. Excellent. Can I share the screen now? Yes, please, Dr. Timala. Yes, it's working. Okay, I'm sorry and for the small technical glitch. I hope it works now. So, uh, I'm a, a surgeon, cardiothoracic and vascular surgeon. Uh, from Kathmandu, Nepal. I'll be talking about the surgical revascularization in critical limb ischemia, in paper RDPs, who, when, and how. So I'd like to uh, cover the, the, basically the basic things about the surgical aspects of the disease. So critical limb ischemia is basically inadequate arterial growth, moderate metabolic needs of the resting tissue. And more formally, transatlantic Atlantic intersocial has uh, described it as a persistent or recurring ischemic pain, patient needing to use opiates for more than two weeks to pain, with uh, patients presenting with ulceration or gangrene, ankle systolic pressure less than 50 or two systolic pressure less than 40 millimeters mercury. It's basically divided into two types. One is uh, supra-inguinal and one is intra-inguinal. Supra-inguinal is basically a cardiac progressive disease the patient can present with claudication of the closed inguinal bleed, thigh, or buttocks, and the impotence may be present among males. The indication for intervention would be severe rest pain, patient presenting with also gangrene, uh, claudication that can impair the lifestyle of the patient, or sometimes patient presenting with Bluetooth syndrome, which is basically peripheral window light from the atherosclerotic aorta above. Now, various uh, surgical techniques being described. One of them is endarterectomy, which is basically removal of the atherosclerotic plug from the vessels. It's usually reserved for localized disease. Its advantage is that the infection rate is quite low with endarterectomy, and it tends to preserve the inflow to the gastric, hypogastric arteries, and also for, it's better for the potency of the male. And it should be reserved for diseases that terminate at or just beyond the eyelid bifurcation because beyond that, the vessel gets smaller and makes people to get the, the endarterectomy. However, it's contraindicated in few situations like uh, patients presenting with total aortic occlusion where the bypass is of a much easier option and patients with extensive disease and, uh, and also patients with, presenting with aneurysms because aneurysms tend to grow after the uh, surgery. 
third type of surgery is aortic bypasses, which is uh, basically two types. One is end-to-end -end and one is end-to-side. Uh, in end-to-end, -end, we try to put the proximal anastomosis as high as possible, trying to uh, just below the renal arteries. So we try to exclude the disease partially. And this is specially used for patients with aneurysms or complete occlusion. It's said to provide a better hemodynamics. And uh, because of its low line, it's, it's easier to cover with the tissue after the surgery, which avoids the aorta enteric fistula. And also compared to end-to-side anastomosis, it tends to give lower, lesser amount of distal emboli. The picture shows the end-to-side anastomosis, where the end of the graft is being anastomosed to the side of the aorta. And this, this type of end-to-side anastomosis tends to preserve the abdominal or pelvic pair, pair collaterals. And especially indicated in when, whenever the abdomen is ever in the renal artery is coming below from the uh, abdominal aorta or the higher arteries, or when the internal mesenteric artery patency is needed, uh, then it's better to do end-to-side than end-to-end anastomosis in the proximal area. So the distal anastomosis could be femoral artery or external iliac artery. And usually femoral artery is uh, preferred because of better exposure. And also the basic patency rate is better in different studies. And uh, whenever the profunda femoris is patent, it uh, speaks of a better long-term graft survival because of better outflow into the veins. Profunda is important uh, artery supply for the lower limb. It can be the sole supply sometimes, and it usually helps keeping it as a collateral between ideal artery and profundal artery. In general, it's less atherosclerotic. Profundoplasty can be used as an adjunctive procedure along with uh, other bypasses. Uh, and also, it can be done in a canopic fashion or more popularly with a patch plasty. This patient who had undergone the femoral and femoral popular bypass, you can see the composite graph, the femoral with dacron and femoral popular with a stratinous vein. Now, the results of aortoideal femoral reconstruction are generally good with long term patency because of uh, probably because of the large vessels and good outflows into the limbs. And the different studies have shown that the five year patency is around 85 to 90 percent and 10-year patency around 70 to 75 percent. This study compared the patency between PTAT graph and datum graph with the PTAT graph slightly better in terms of uh, four-year patency. Now, another uh, class of disease is infra-inguinal periarteral artery disease. Uh, these diseases are usually diffuse but quite segmental, so that's why the bypass graph is often possible. And the intro for the bypasses, the info could be from anywhere from common femoral artery, profonda, superficial femoral artery, orbital artery, or tibial artery, and the insertion could be any of the arteries, including pedal arteries. So, preoperative preparation generally needs a detailed vascular mapping, and CTNG is quite helpful in that aspect. And autogenous pain is the best conduit so far, and the duplex mapping does help in getting the best vein. For the graft. And the vein, veins available are greater saphenous vein, lesser saphenous vein, or, or extremity vein. And veins should be in general at least three millimeters in diameter, soft and compressible. And they can be used in a reverse fashion or non reverse with in situ fashion after destruction of the valve. In general, the operative planning takes, uh, one has to think about alternatives. If plan A fails, then one has to switch to plan B or plan C that has to be prepared beforehand. One, uh, and complications have to be carefully avoided in each step. And if there's uh, inflow lesions with a resting red in the more than 10 millimeter mercury compared to the radial artery pressure, then uh, something has to be done for the inflow, like uh, endarterectomy, or for example, more profound positioning of the graph or stenting for adequate inflow. And conduit quality does play a significant role in long term patency. And length of the bypass graph has to be carefully thought of. And if the profunda or deep femoral artery is supplanted, that needs to be corrected at the very first surgery. 
outflow considerations needs better judgment. And one should try to uh, bypass all the hemodynamic decisions and reasons. And the greater the output, the better the long term results. Output could be anywhere from femoral femur positive, PDL, or fetal arteries. And sometimes distal adjuncts are needed, like vein patch or vein cough, especially when the TPAT graph is being anastomosed to below knee situations. Or sometimes in distal AV fissure is created to increase the flow across the graph when the outflow area is poor. Now there are basically two types of uh, conduits. One is autogenous and one is prosthetic. Autogenous could be greater subvenous vein, lesser subvenous vein, or any vein can be found. <clears throat> and the prosthetic vein could be diachron, heparin bonded diachron, TPAT graft, or human umbilical veins. And as I have already stated, that great subvenous vein output forms all other conduits. And in general, each lateral greater subvenous vein is uh, preferred compared to contralateral vein. This picture shows the sadness vein bypass graph from femoral to popliteal. On the left, you can see the sadness vein anastomosis to femoral artery, and the right is uh, sadness vein to the popliteal artery over the association. Popliteal is one, one of the most commonly used uh, prosthetic grafts. On the left is a pep vein bypass. On the right is composite grafting then with a PTAT proximally and a sadness vein for the distal anastomosis. Uh, for PTAP, the, the most commonly used graft, and then for below knee situation, addition of vein cough around the PTAP confers the significant uh, patency advantages. And this study published in 97 showed that uh, a few years' time when the vein cough is added to PTAP, the graft patency was 32% compared to 29% without vein cough. And similarly, limb salvage, which is our main goal of the surgery, remains 84% with vein cough and 62% without vein cough. This picture shows the uh, vein cough, one of the vein cough, there are different types of course, and the PTAP graft being anastomosis to the distal artery with the vein cough uh, intervening in between the two vessels. So the multivessel disease requires uh, simultaneous vessel grafting with patients undergoing aorto, bifemoral, bifemoral, Bipopital bypass grafts. After surgery, we do complexion studies. Generally, clinical studies are easier to do with a, like a palpation of the pulse uh, just beyond the anastomosis in the native artery. That gives some idea of uh, what's, what has happened with the graft. And also, Doppler study is quite easy to do. And uh, there are quite good advantages of uh, doing completion energy after the surgery. And different studies have shown that after completion angio, the correction was needed from 8% to 27% of the patients. And angioscopies and intra duplex are a little complex. And they, they, they are usually reserved for patients who underwent in situ drafts because uh, to make sure that the venous um, valves are being lysed completely, or sometimes they may be used in arm veins uh, because arm veins tend to have thrombus. Uh, uh, some thrombocytating things inside the veins, so they may be used in that situation. So after surgery, after when the patient goes home, again, graft surveillance is uh, needed, and it's especially priority for vein grafts compared to prosthetic grafts, because they tend to go into more hyperplasia. Surveillance can be done with duplex, interbrachial index, or angiography, and appropriate and timely intervention can form the frequency of the graph. The real results of uh, bypass graphs are usually described in terms of hard endpoints like a graph frequency, limb salvage, or mortality. And in randomized prospective trials have shown that the initiative graph is as good as the uh, reverse starting of end graph. Uh, just uh, I'd like to show it, this paper published in 2011 regarding basic data related to surgical infra inguinal revascularization procedures from Kenneth et al. Uh, I'm just showing you in brief the temporal aggregate data. This includes both uh, above knee and below knee situation regarding primary patency. It's comparison between vein graph and PTAP, and one can uh, look through 
all the different types of craft which have been included in this presentation. So in five years, the service has been limited 72% of the time, legal PTAT 51%. By 10 years, 51% of the submiss men were patent and for PTAT it was only 32%. Wind salvage, which is our main goal of the surgery most of the time. By five years, 87% of the submiss men were uh, each submiss men, the limb was patent, limb was salvaged, compared to 82% in PTAT lab. So in 10 years time, it's 89% for the submiss men versus 71% for PTAT lab. The patient survival is not much that different again in by five years time. 65% uh, for the Sabinus men and 61% for the PTAT lab. In 10 years' time, it's 32% for the Sabinus men and 33% for the PTAT lab. This image is study compared uh, between the heparin bonded background graft and PTAT for femoropopical bypass. This is five year results of the prospective randomized trial for multicellular clinical trials published uh, in 2004 in general vascular surgery. And the implicit the result shows that the primary patents have three years of better with heparin bonded daphne graft, 50% patency, compared to PTAT graft, which is 44% uh, patency. But the difference was no longer statistically significant at five years' time, with heparin bonded daphne being 46% patent and PTAT graft being 30% patent, and p value was 0.055. Besides anatomic bypass graphic and there are situations when we have to do some extra anatomic bypasses. I would like to just briefly talk through this. One is the femfem bypass, which is quite easy, technically easier thing to do and quite common procedures. And it's also done for hostile abdomen and when there's unilateral iliac occlusion. The other one is anterofemoral bypass grafting. You can see the graft being uh, proximally placed in the ACV artery and this to be extended down to the femoral artery. It's useful for patients with infected aorta or those patients presenting with infected uh, prosthetic graphs. Another one is operator bypass graft. You can see the bypass graft uh, at the top here is uh, anastomosed to the iliac artery, brought down through the obturator foramen instead of going through the groin, and then passing back into the pontial artery. It's also useful for Graft patient presenting with joint sepsis, patient with uh, infected sugar aneurysm after those with uh, drug addicts, they found the problem with infected sugar aneurysm, and that's what this uh, hypothesis is for so a patient presenting with uh, brain neoplasms or brain irradiation. This picture shows the triopoly abdominal or femoral bypass graft. You can see the PTAT graft being in a small portion of the descending triacid aorta and distally to the distal abdominal aorta. These, graft, these bypasses are used for patients present with aortic, infected aortic prosthesis or patients with that already prior abdominal surgeries or those who are present with failed by intradenal aortic replacements. I'd like to show you some of the complications of bypass graft. Uh, this patient who had undergone aorto by iliac grafting presented with occluded graft. Again, this is another occluded graft patient initially underwent aorto by femoral graft, which was again, uh, same thing bypass was done, but again, that was occluded. Wound infection is another common surgery complication for any kind of surgery, including bypass grafts. And this patient had a hematoma due to anastomotic leakage. And this lady underwent a stem stem bypass in the past and now presenting with a graph extrusion through the skin. Thank you for the kind attention. Thank you, Dr. Tamala. Um, some very impressive pictures of some beautiful surgery there. And a, a very timely reminder of the importance of us having surgery as a part of our toolbox for treating patients with peripheral artery disease. I think it, it sometimes gets overlooked as not important as the endovascular options. And it's still our gold standard in many ways. Um, so thank you. 
I'm interested in your practice. Um, what proportion of patients have supra-inguinal disease compared to patients who have infra-inguinal disease that you're treating? Uh, I think most of the patients do present with uh, infra-inguinal disease. Uh, I haven't calculated definitely, but uh, roughly I would say 60 versus 40 percent. Mm. So still, still reasonably high rates with supra-inguinal disease, though. Yeah, it is. And challenging to manage. Um, thank you for sharing all, all these uh, all these pictures for us non non surgeons. It's definitely a lot to take in. But I guess my I just have a one simple question, which is you know we as somebody who does endovascular work, I don't routinely think about uh, surgical revascularization as the first option. Are there, are there patients in particular that you would start the conversation first with surgical revascularization and endo uh, as a bailout? As a bailout, you mean? A, or as a, either in combo or, or sort of as a secondary option? Or... Uh, I do not do endovascular things, because some of my friends do does that. So in general, I talk, uh, Surgical aspect first, and then if the lesion is inaccessible, or because here in Nepal it's a question of affordability is there, so uh, we very rarely have to talk about endovascular. But uh, those who can afford to have it or inaccessible diseases, or it's, uh, sometimes it's a very simple reason to treat with, then we do uh, talk regarding endovascular therapy in those patients. I think certainly from my my perspective as a surgeon in Sydney, common femoral disease, particularly in claudicants, we'd be still leaning towards first line open surgical intervention in patients who don't have a hostile groin and whose anatomy is suitable. And a lot of the aorta iliac occlusive disease will still have a discussion about the merits of open surgery versus endo in those cases and we've got a very heavy endovascular practice in Australia but the the long-term patency rates as Dr. Tamila showed are very are very favorable for some of those large surgical interventions it's just finding the right patient yeah yes well no, the good thing is we don't have to look for very small vessels Exactly. <laughs> but beyond one millimeter, we do not have to think about uh, revascularizing those things. Those small, tiny vessels. <laughs> That's the good thing about surgery. Yes, once we start getting into our distal pedal bypasses, it gets increasingly complex. <laughs> little, little vessels. Um, well, Dr. Tamala, thank you very much, and apologies over the technology challenges we. We got there in the end. Um, and thank you to all of our panellists for joining us this afternoon. It's been a really enjoyable and informative discussion around management of patients with peripheral artery disease. I mentioned before, but I am really, really like how we started off with thinking about how we can screen and how we can identify PAD patients who are often unrecognised and who have a lot of unmet health health needs and how we can optimize their outcomes medically with the increasing use of medications for risk prevention, including DOAX. And then into how endovascular treatment needs to be viewed in light of IVUS, which I think is a really important take home um, message for us all that do in endovascular intervention. And finally, not forgetting the importance of exercise therapy and surgical therapy in this group of patients, because it meets a very important need for symptomatic and um, long-term survival care. So a big thank you to everyone. I hope we all take away some important messages and think about our practice and consider how we might change our practice in order to address some of these needs. So, and big thank you to um, Dr. Chang for your, your co-chairing.
as well and Dr. Um, Yunli Lin for organizing the webinar. Thank you. Okay. I think uh, he's, he's I muted. I think Dr. Lin, you're muted if you were trying to talk. No, <laughs> muted, muted. I can't unmute. Okay, yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, actually, I'm the one who is learning a lot from the whole webinar. It started from a screening for a medical therapy, endovascular, surgical, and also exercise test. Actually, in the beginning, I've been talking to Peter that he, it's very difficult to do the exercise, supervised exercise not to mention home-based exercise, but it's a situation for PAD now. It's very really difficult, very really difficult. It's just an ongoing challenge for all of us, I think. Especially a surgeon, I you think. Know, a surgeon, they, they used to be taking a lot of job, but uh, it seems to me endovascular is not really taking everything. So <laughs> especially for above growing, it's a big problem. I don't know <laughs> what you will suggest for those with uh, below the uh, below ileal artery or total occluded. It's really something for the surgeon. But uh, I don't know if in Sydney, you, you, Dr. Alkin, you are also doing the vascular more or you open? We, we train in both open and endovascular okay. surgery. So we, we do a mix of both. Um, but certainly we've seen an increase in endovascular treatments as over the last decade. And I think most of us would have practices that are probably about 70% endovascular and, and about 30 open. So. Yes. Maybe just as Peter just mentioned, uh, we are forgetting how to decide when to consult surgeon first for open, yeah. open cases. <laughs> Yeah, for endo more, endo more. Same yeah. here. I think I think the majority of vascular surgeons would do an endo first approach uh, here in Singapore. Oh, yeah. Okay. Thank you all for all the contribution the whole webinar, <laughs> and uh, I think uh, everyone learned a lot from this. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you for all contribution. Okay. You. See you all. Okay. Well, bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Okay. Thank you.